Thank you. It's great to be back here. It's my nth visit, where n is probably six or seven, but it's first time I'm staying at Simon Center, which is a great place as well. Um, so I take some risk, some chances with this talk. Uh, we have a special uh, program uh, on billiards at Simon Center, so I decided it should be a talk about billiards, but uh, my topic is uh, elementary uh, in some sense, uh, goes back almost 2,000 years, at least the beginning of the talk. Um, and another thing which uh, I will do, which normally is not done at colloquium talks, uh, I actually want to prove th things. Uh, since the, it's a simple geometry, I, I want to present several proofs. Let's see how it goes. OK, so billiards in conics. Um, So um, probably everyone uh, knows more or less what uh, billiards are, but I'll uh, say uh, some words. Uh, so I'll be talking about billiards in the plane uh, inside uh, strictly convex uh, domains, uh, smooth boundary, positive curvature. Uh, oftentimes they're referred uh, to as Birgov billiards. And they model motion of free particle inside this domain with elastic reflection of the boundary. So the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. The same law, uh, of course, describes uh, the optical reflection. So you can think of uh, the boundary of the billiard uh, table as uh, ideal mirror and trajectories as rays of light. Uh, an important notion for my talk is that of uh, caustic. A caustic, uh, which you see. Uh, on the right, uh, this red curve, it's a curve inside the billiard table uh, with the property that uh, if, uh, I'll say, ray of light is tangent to this curve, then the reflected ray is again tangent, and it continues uh, forever. And uh, the word caustic, me yes? So what, what's the condition? Uh, that uh, if you start tangent to this curve, then reflected ray is tangent, and so on. Always reflected. Yeah. Um, uh, right, so the word caustic means burning, uh, and uh, indeed, uh, rainbow, for example, is a caustic. Uh, that is not periodic, right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe well, it is. <laughs> well, maybe period is large. Period. If I tell you that it's million periodic, uh, hard to tell. Um, but uh, yeah, ca caustic doesn't have to be periodic, but periodic caustics also uh, exist, may exist. Uh, so. Um, an important uh, result, uh, uh, which belongs to KM theory, kolmogorov arnold moser uh, theory, is the existence of uh, caustics. If the boundary curve is sufficiently smooth, it's Lazutkin's uh, theorem, uh, which is classical now 1973. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, KM. Like I say, my talk is more elementary than that. Uh, I want to say um, something about um, symplectic structure, symplectic nature of billiard reflection. So the space of uh, oriented lines in the plane, uh, it's two-dimensional. How do you characterize a line? You choose an origin, and a line has direction, which is a point on the circle. Uh, and uh, then there is assigned distance from the line to the origin. And this sign is given by uh, right-hand rule. Uh, so altogether, space of oriented uh, lines is a cylinder, a circle of alpha uh, times a real line of p. And it has area form, uh, in this coordinates dp d alpha, uh, which is preserved by uh, billiard reflection independently on the shape of the curve. It's true for every curve. And uh, this is a much more general uh, thing than I present here. You it reflecting off the surface? Or a higher dimensional thing? In higher dimensional, it's true as well. So it should be even dimensional or odd dimensional? Yes, the space of oriented lines is always even dimensional. What? The space of oriented lines is always even dimensional. So for example, the space of oriented lines in three space, its dimension is four. In n dimensional space, two n minus two. And that's what, uh, exactly what uh, I want to say at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so this, this fact is much more general than um, this particular uh, coordinates in the plane. It's true uh, for any Riemannian manifold, the space of uh, non parameterized oriented geodesics. If it's a manifold, it's symplectic. So locally, it's always symplectic. And if so it's global. So this is a discrete time process. Yes. 
it moves along like this, it's just one, one vector. Yeah, I, I ignore. It bounces off. I think of this as going to this. Okay. It's a discrete uh, time system, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's always true that uh, billiard optical reflection is a symplectic map. And uh, like I say, it's true in very general situation. For example, one can consider Finsler manifolds, which are not Riemannian even. But again, this is for your information. It's, I'm not going to use it. I'm in the plane with the Euclidean uh, metric until the last slide. OK, so um, some people in the room will recognize this picture. Alfonso, I didn't ask your permission, but it was published in our joint um, journal. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a beautiful picture which uh, tells the whole story about a billiard inside an ellipse. Uh, so what you see here are several trajectories uh, which are color-coded. And um, let's start with the outer one, uh, the green one. Uh, so it's almost uh, tangent, almost gliding. Uh, then there is a blue one, uh, which is not so much tangent. And you see that uh, there are many uh, links of this blue trajectory. You see that uh, they envelop a curve. And this curve is confocal ellipse. This is a, a, a caustic of uh, billiard inside an ellipse. And the theorem is that uh, the interior of the uh, ellipse, except for the uh, segment connecting the two foci, foci are orange, uh, is foliated by caustics and their confocal ellipses. This is a classical fact. I don't know whether it was known to the <coughs> Greeks uh, or not, but it certainly was known in 19th century. Um, then you have the an or foliations. Uh, it's a foliation of the uh, interior minus the segment connecting uh, the uh, foci. But the lines cross, so there's two foliations. No, the, the foliation on confocal, confocal ellipses, they're caustics. Uh, forget lines, just think about this curve and. Oh, oh the caustic foliate. Yeah, the caustic oh. foliate, oh. yeah. And uh, that's precisely the topic of my talk. Uh, you can say that uh, billiard inside the ellipse is integrable. The word integrable has different meaning for different people, but that's what uh, is happening here, and you will. Um, my topic is to, to show you the geometrical consequences of this fact. Some of them, I hope, will be new to you. Uh, I would say that probably every person in the ro uh, room will see something new for him or her. Uh, okay. a yes. Let's try. Okay. No, no, every uh, sufficiently smooth, strictly convex curve has caustics near the boundary. Actually, they accumulate to the boundary, and uh, the measure, relative measure tends to one. So there are many, but there are gaps between them. Foliation is exceptional. I'll say a few words about this. But again, that would be a topic of another talk, how exceptional. Um, more questions? Uh, so um, to finish with this picture, uh, there is this uh, orange trajectory which starts at uh, a focus and it reflects to a focus. This is a fact which was known to the Greeks for sure. Uh, and uh, this trajectory is special. It's different from the ones which are tangent uh, to confocal ellipses. And uh, then the, uh, there is this pink or uh, what's the word, violet um, trajectory uh, which is uh, each link intersects the segment connecting the foci, and uh, they also envelop a curve, which you see here, and this is confocal hyperbola. So there are two uh, hyperbola, confocal hyperbola, with the same foci. So th this, um, this ellipse uh, gives us two, actually two uh, families, one parameter families of curves, confocal ellipses, which foliate, and confocal hyperbolas, which also foliate. OK. Um, so here's my first proof. I want to prove to you that uh, there is this foliation by uh, caustics. And um, this is a very elementary, but I think not very well known uh, proof, uh, which, by the way, works in every dimension. But again, I, my topic is planar, so in the plane. So here is my uh, ellipse. And uh, now I um, <clears throat> consider the phase space, uh, which consists of points on the ellipse and unit inward vectors which define trajectory. And the map, uh, as, as we uh, said already, it's a map. It's not a um, continuous time system. It's discrete time system. The map takes a pair xu to pair 
y v. So first you go along this line, and vector u is parallel translated, and then you reflect. Reflection is uh, optical reflection, so the angles here are equal. And the claim. Do you take the length as one of the parameters, or do you just take the line in this direction? Uh, one parameter is a point on the boundary. Another is the direction of the line. Just the direction, not yes. the length of the vector. No, no, it's unit vector, so direction. Well, you don't need to have the, the size of the vector. I don't care about size, only no. direction. Yeah, but uh, I make it unit to, for this argument to work. Oh. Okay. All right. So what I'm saying is uh, that uh, there is a conserved quantity, an integral. Uh, if the ellipse is given by uh, this quadratic formula, ax dot x is, is 1, a is a symmetric 2 by 2 matrix, uh, then I claim that the following quantity, ax dot u, uh, is preserved by this map. That is ax dot u equals ay dot v. And like I say, it's true for uh, in every, every dimension for an ellipsoid, uh, and if uh, this Conserved quantity. This integral has a name. It's called Joachim Stahl uh, integral. And the proof consists of two lines. Uh, the first line is here. Uh, and here I uh, use the fact that A is uh, self adjoint, symmetric. So I write AX plus AY dot Y minus X. Uh, open, uh, collect terms. Uh, some things happen. Uh, so AX, X is 1, AY 1, AY. Y is 1, so these two ones cancel. And these two things are also equal because A is symmetric. So we get 0. And this means that AXU is minus AYU. That's first line. The second line is here. Now we look at this point, and uh, we see uh, that Y is at the same point, but U, uh, vector U, outward unit vector, becomes inward uh, unit vector V. And the billiard reflection law says that their sum, u plus v, is tangent uh, to the ellipse at point y. Now, what is the normal at this point? The normal to the, this ellipse is ay. And that's what is in here. ay dot u plus v is 0. And this means that ayu equals minus ayv. And comparing these two things, we see that integral is preserved. End of proof. OK, uh, before, uh, last slide before applications. Um, so what do we have? Uh, we have billiard resummation, which uh, is area preserving the general effect, which I mentioned, and which has a system affiliation on caustics. This picture is the phase space of the billiard, and um, it's foliated by invariant curves corresponding to confocal ellipses. Then there is a singular leaf here. This corresponds to that orange trajectory, which goes through foci. It's special. And then there is, uh, inside these eyes, there are foliations on uh, invariant curves, which correspond to those trajectories which are tangent to hyperbolas. Remember this pink or uh, violet trajectory in the picture. Uh, these two points, this is a two-periodic trajectory, uh, which is the minor axis of the ellipse. It um, bounces back and forth. It's two-periodic. So this is a full. Um, so uh, where, where is this happening? These are the yes. previous discussion. I don't uh, right. Uh, this is happening in this uh, phase space, which consists of points x on the curve, so it's a circle, and a unit vector, which uh, can be also thought as uh, this angle. So this is on the circle cross a circle? A cir no, cr a circle cross a uh, segment. Unit, unit in inward, it's inward. So it's characterized by this angle, which is between 0 and 2 pi. Zero uh, and pi. pi. Okay. 0 and pi, yes. Half so, okay. yes, that's the phase space. Uh, we can also understand this picture differently. We can think of this. The circle direction, horizontal? Uh, of course, yes. Huh? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, horizontal circle and vertical. Two sides together? Yes. Okay. Well, I can draw. I, I mean, I can draw it, but it's yeah. flat, flattened. Um, <coughs> Another way to, to understand this picture. This is the, uh, the set of oriented lines which intersect my ellipse. You remember p and alpha coordinates. So alpha is arbitrary from 0 to pi. And p is, well, p is bounded by uh, support function of an ellipse. 
Okay, so um, here is an important thing, uh, which is a very particular case of a general theorem, which is called arnold louisville theorem, but here it's elementary. Uh, on each invariant curve, uh, which you see here, there is a special choice of coordinate in which the billiard map is just parallel translation. This choice of special coordinate is dictated by area. So consider, say, this invariant curve, and consider nearby. Nearby means infinitesimally nearby curve. Uh, and we use the area between the two to measure distance on this curve. Now, our map is area preserving, and it preserves each invariant curve. Um, uh, so it preserves this one form. Yes? Well, let's see the picture. I look at the picture to take them seriously. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you have to identify the, the two edges, the two vertical edges, right. to get the real space. Yes. But it would, the picture suggests that you're identifying it in the obvious way, and, and all those orbits are periodic, and that's what. No, no. What no, you don't see orbits here. You see invariant curves. Uh, every curve consists of points, and these points jump around. Every orbit is uh, confined to a curve, but it's not periodic. It's not necessarily periodic. Oh, oh these are invariant curves. Uh, these are invariant curves, yes. Oh. And now I'm saying that oh, on, oh, on a... Oh, this is vector field is tangent to that family of curves that you're following the flow. But. Yep. And I'm saying that we, we can introduce on each invariant curve its own coordinate or its own measure, if you wish, uh, which will be preserved by the map. So the map will be just parallel translation. X goes to X plus constant. Constant depending on the curve. So two, two ways to, to say it. One way is to use area instead of length. I'm not saying length. There is no length in, in, in this picture. But there is area, invariant area. So I can, for example, I have a segment on this invariant curve which I want to measure. Instead, I consider a rectangle between this curve and nearby curve. It has area. Well, if the distance is epsilon, then I should divide this area by epsilon, take limit as epsilon goes to zero, and I get one form. And this one form is preserved by the map because it preserves area and because it preserves these curves. Uh, a more sophisticated way to say it is I take that integral. You remember your style integral. And uh, I consider it's Hamiltonian vector field. There is an area form here, so I can consider a Hamiltonian vector field to be tangent to these curves, and I choose coordinate in which this um, vector field is just d over dx. That x will be my coordinate. Okay? Each picture is a picture of the invariant. Yeah, except there's, it's problematic at the same the points, right? Where the, where the well, what the second? Functions. I started asking a question, and you started asking a second question. <laughs> this is the the, the picture is a picture of the of a, of the kernel of the invariant one form, right? I mean, the picture is a picture of the invariant one form. <coughs> right. See, I mean, you you have a Hamiltonian which is constant on these curves. Whose whose level curves are these curves? Right. right. So, if, and then when you try to talk about the parameterization, actually there are some singular points in the, these level curves. Uh, right. I do not go. I don't go that high. I only consider the this part. Uh, this part consists of. Uh, rays of light, which are tangent to confocal ellipses. So I'm talking only about that. If we need to talk about hyperbolas, we, we should go there. But mostly I'm talking about confocal ellipses. OK? All right, so let's start with applications. The very first application is uh, Poncelet parism. So um, this is probably known to everyone, but I will pretend that not everyone knows and remind you what it is. Um, it's uh, probably the most beautiful theorem of projective uh, geometry. One has two conics, two ellipses in this picture. Uh, they are nested, outer, inner. And one plays the following game. One takes a point on the outer one, draws tangent line to the inner one until you get back to the outer one, and continue. So this process may be periodic or not. The statement is that if uh, it's periodic with period n, five in this picture, then it's true for every starting point. It will be periodic with the same period, same number of uh, times you go around. This is uh, Poncelet parism. Poncelet parism is 20, uh, sorry, 200 plus years old. And uh, there is a little story which I probably should uh, tell. Poncelet was uh, an officer uh, in the Polonic army uh, during the war with Russia. 
And he was wounded um, in the Western uh, Russian left to, to die on the battlefield, but he didn't die and he was taken prisoner of war. And um, after a march to the city of Saratov on Volga River, very far away, he survived this. And he spent more than a year in captivity uh, in, in um, prisoner of war camp. Uh, the time was different from today, and uh, the officers didn't have to work. They could even practice in fencing. He had plenty of time, and uh, he was a graduate of Ecole Polytechnique, which was a very good school, and his uh, teacher of geometry was Monge. And so he started with uh, trying to remember everything he was taught, and then he continued, continued developing this. And what he developed was projected geometry. Um, he went back to, to France after the war ended in 1813 and eventually published a book uh, based on his Saratov notebooks. And this was one of the theorems he discovered in captivity. And if you like mathematical hoaxes, um, read this article which we wrote jointly with, with Richard Schwartz. So it contains two theorems which are true theorems, but also contains a story which is not true. Try to figure out what's what, I will not tell you. Um, okay, next application. Uh, so if you remember still that uh, picture of um, face space, uh, the system of confocal ellipses, they all share the same caustics, which are confocal ellipses, okay? A consequence of this uh, ob trivial observation is that if we have two confocal ellipses, like you see here, the two outer one, uh, we can consider two billiard reflections in the outer one and in the inner one. <coughs> And they commute. That's what you see here. So you start with this, for example, uh, line. You reflect in the inner one, then you reflect in the outer one, or you first reflect in the outer one and then in the inner one, and the result is the same. So why is that? Because every invariant curve has um, coordinates in which the billiard map is parallel translation. Parallel translations commute. And that's what you see here. Any questions about that? Proof? That's the proof. <laughs> um, yes, I, I have proved it. Uh, so parallel translations, the, the coordinates on this invariant curve don't depend on the billiard you are using. They're all the same. They're confocal ellipses. So for every confocal ellipse, it's the same thing. Uh, a particular case of uh, this uh, theorem, uh, if you start at a focus, you remember, if you start with the focus, you reflect to the focus. So this is this picture. This parallel and translation with respect to what? Usually that's with respect to a connection. Parallel it's with respect to the coordinates which are introduced using uh, invariant area and uh, the existence of integral. It's consequence of integrability. Uh, I remember that foliation and, well, Hamiltonian vector field. I'm just saying that that coordinates we introduce, uh, these coordinates we, that we introduced, they don't depend on which billiard you choose from this confocal family. They're, they only depend on one single ellipse in this family. Okay, so um, I want to uh, challenge you with this. Uh, so this is a particular case uh, when you start and uh, finish uh, at uh, foci. Let's erase the um, ellipses, but remember that uh, an ellipse is the locus of points such that sum of distances to foci is constant. So if we erase this, then this picture becomes what is known as most elementary uh, theorem or problem of elementary geometry. Uh, it's Pido's uh, expression, and here it is. So in this picture, AC plus CB uh, equal, uh, equals AD plus BD, if and only if AE plus EB equals AF plus FB. Try to prove it using high school geometry. It's a true fact, and it, it was rediscovered several times. It was known, uh, I think the uh, first person to publish it was uh, De Morgan, De Morgan laws in uh, set theory or lo logic, but it was rediscovered several times. Mm -hmm. The first part you were talking about reflection, which involves the notion of angle. Right. This, in this part with the punctuated port, okay. it's glancing off 
decide, let me finish, I know you understand my question now, you've changed the structure. Now this makes sense in projective geometry where you don't have angles. Yes. So you've switched. Yes, thank you. I forgot, I forgot I to say. I was going to ask you how yes. much of the first works for projective yes. geometry. So. I, I forgot to, to say what happens here. So uh, given two nested ellipses, there is always a projective transformation which takes them to confocal ellipses. This theorem only involves points and lines, so it's projectively invariant. Right. So the proof which I presented, presented was, of course, for confocal ellipses. But the statement is more general, and it's a free um, generalization. You just apply projective transformation, and you get the most general one. Oh, confocal, you're saying the glassing system, which is projectively invariant, for confocal ellipses can be described by angles? Yes. Okay. And yes. They're, they're yes. So I use extra. That's what I was. Saying. Yes. I, I, okay. I should have said that. Yes. Okay. Next. String construction. Uh, so string construction is also a classical construction. I don't know who was the first to invent it, to discover it. Uh, it's a way to reconstruct billiard table from its caustic. So suppose I give you a curve which wants to be a caustic of a billiard. Uh, table, but one doesn't know the table, how to construct it, reconstruct it. Uh, you have to give yourself a string, non-stretchable string of fixed length, wrap it around this curve, and just move the free uh, end, keeping it tight. And it will create a curve. And the claim is that uh, that curve is boundary of billiard table for which the original curve is uh, caustic. Actually, this construction has a parameter, the length of the string. And in this way, you construct not one, but one parameter family of tables which share the same caustic. Now, I wanted to prove it. Uh, actually, I think it's very um, appropriate for multivariable calculus exercise. Unfortunately, it's not in the books we use, <coughs> at least at Penn State. Um, so here, here's the proof, uh, which is also one line proof. Uh, consider a point outside. Of, of this oval. This is not necessarily for ellipses, it's about ovals. In this yes. Process, you fix A and B and you move X around. No, I don't fix A and B. I fix I wrap it around and move it around. Uh, so going around the circle. Mm -hmm. So points A and B move mm -hmm. as, as I move point X. Mm -hmm. Okay? So here's the proof. Uh, Consider point x outside of this oval, and consider two functions. Uh, d uh, choose some point on the other side, O. The final result doesn't depend on this choice. And consider two functions, distance from x to O going on the left, and distance from x to O going on the right. So two functions, f and g. What are their gradients? Tautologically, almost tautologically, uh, gradients of these functions are unit vectors along this tangent Segments, that and that. Now, what is the locus which I described by uh, uh, the string construction? It's the locus of points where f plus g is constant. And so the gradient of f plus g is perpendicular to this locus. And sum of two unit vectors perpendicular means that two angles are equal, and that's billiard reflection. End of proof. So. A particular case was certainly known in the 19th century. It's called Graves' uh, theorem. And the theorem says that if you use this string construction on an ellipse, what you construct is a confocal ellipse. But in our um, billiard setup, it's a more general statement. So you, you can start on any oval and construct the one part of the family of um, billiards for which uh, this oval is acoustic. OK, now I want to introduce coordinates in the exterior of an ellipse. So I start with an ellipse. And uh, you remember it has certain <coughs> coordinate system on it, which comes from integrability. Uh, given a point outside, I draw two tangent lines and read the coordinates of the tangency points in this coordinate system. So they are denoted by S and T. And these two numbers, S and T, will be coordinates of the point outside. OK? So if we. Are you taking an arbitrary uh, parameterization of the ellipse? Or no, no, no. Not arbitrary. No, it's, Ar that, arbitrary? it's that parameterization. The one given by <coughs> Arnold Lewis theorem or Hamiltonian vector field of Joachim Stahl integral. It's a very special one. 
but every ellipse uh, has one, and um, we remember that there is a confocal family. So in this uh, coordinates, confocal family is given uh, just by a very simple relation. The di distance between points t and c, difference of t and s, is constant. That's the Graves theorem, if you wish. And confocal hyperboles are given by a similar relation. The sum is constant. So if you move this point around, the difference between t and s will be constant in this Graves construction. And uh, if you move these points toward each other so that t plus s is constant, what you create is confocal hyperbola. And the billiard reflections in confocal ellipse, in every confocal ellipse, is given by, as I already said several times, by a shift, t goes to t plus constant. And the reflection in confocal hyperbola, which are perpendicular to confocal uh, ellipses, is given by a similar formula, t goes to constant minus t. It's in involution. If you do it twice, you, you, you get a parallel translation. So what I want to present now is um, another classical geometrical statement, which is called Ivory's lemma. It, of course, is more general than uh, my slide shows. It holds in every dimension, but uh, I'm in the plane. So what you see here is um, a quadrilateral if you wish, rectangle, which is made by two confocal hyperbolas and two confocal ellipses. They all share these two foci. And the statement is that the diagonals of this uh, quadrilateral are equal. So this was discovered by uh, Ivory in a very uh, uh, old paper, uh, again, more than 200 years, actually before Poncelli theorem even. Ivory uh, was a physicist who was uh, studying the attraction of homogeneous ellipsoids, gravitational attraction. And he proved uh, that equipotential uh, surfaces are confocal uh, ellipsoids. He worked in dimension three, but uh, this uh, statement uh, is true in every dimension. And I want to. What's the statement here? The diagonals are equal. Oh, equal. Oh. Okay. Um, I learned it a long time ago from Arnold, and uh, he complained that he didn't know a proof which is not computational. And some 30 years later, I found a proof which is not computational, but uses billiards. And that's what I want to show you. So in the statement, you choose any pair of confocals? Uh, confocal, yes. Yeah, everything inside is confocal. <coughs> well, uh, you, you pro yeah, I, I don't know if you, instead of uh, the, this one, take this one, may, maybe uh, should be uh, still true. But anyway, watch my hands. I'll show you proof. Yeah. All right, so the idea of the proof is uh, as follows. Suppose I am totally crazy, and I want to prove that two diagonals of a rectangle are equal. But I want to prove it using billiards. So the way I do it is as follows. First of all, I. Uh, I want to uh, no note that if a ray of light or billiard trajectory enters a right angle, then it exits in the same direction. It makes sense because if you consider a parallel um, trajectory, parallel ray of light, it will come very close to the uh, angle, reflect twice, and go in the parallel direction. So we can extend this reflection to uh, diagonals, and this will be just going back. OK? So now, this is a rectangle, and I want to show that this diagonal equals this diagonal. The way I do it, uh, I in include the two diagonals into one parameter family of four periodic billiard trajectories, which are shown here. But the billiard trajectory uh, is extremal of a quadrilateral, which is inscribed into this. So we have a function, the perimeter length, which is constant uh, on this um, one parameter family, in particular, the perimeter of each of the uh, uh, quadrilaterals you see here, this um, purple quadrilaterals, uh, are equal. In particular, this diagonal and this diagonal have the same length. Yes? Why are the lengths of all of these equal? Uh, OK, I didn't say it. I should have uh, said it at the very beginning. So. Um, Suppose you want to find a periodic billiard trajectory, n periodic. So what you need to do is to consider uh, inscribed n gons into your billiard table and take uh, the ones for which the perimeter length is critical. 
So it's a variational formulation. And uh, if you have a one parameter family, uh, if you have a curve which consists of critical points, the function is constant on this curve. And that's what I'm using here. Okay, so uh, it just remains to repeat this in the uh, uh, confocal case. So here's my quadrilateral. Here is its diagonal. Uh, I find the uh, caustic. I find the tendency point. And now I consider uh, four periodic trajectories which are tangent to the same caustic. Now I need to show that they close up. This is because reflection in confocal ellipse is given by parallel translation. The reflection in confocal hyperbola is constant minus parameter. If you compose four such things, you will get a parallel translation. But there is a fixed point, the original diagonal. So that parallel translation is identity. And this means that all, four, all of these four periodic trajectories are actually closed trajectories. And then, again, I have one parameter family, and they interpolate between two diagonals, and they are equal. OK? Uh, one can say more about uh, these quadrilaterals. So this is another 19th century theorem, uh, Schall. Uh, so what happens here is uh, we have two confocal ellipses, as always, as usual. I took two points on the outer one, A and B, and draw tangent lines to the inner one. So I get four lines, and they make a quadrilateral. And the theorem says that this quadrilateral has an inscribed circle. OK? Now let me prove it. So there are four points uh, on the inner ellipse where the line's tangent, S1, S2. Again, I use the same magic coordinates, always. So S1, S2, T1, T2. Now, uh, the points A and B are on confocal ellipse, which is given by the condition that difference of coordinates is constant. T1 minus S1 equals T2 minus S2. If you rewrite it and read it as T1 plus S2 equals T2 plus S1, you see that points uh, C and D are on confocal hyperbola. That's almost for free. Uh, but we can do a little better. Um, remember these two functions, F and G, going from a point outside around on the left and right. Uh, so points A and B are on confocal ellipse. We have uh, this equality. Points C and D are confocal hyperbola. We have this equality. Now we add them, or maybe subtract, I mean, combine them, and uh, cancel um, what can be canceled. What remains is this. And this is exactly necessary and sufficient for equilateral to in, uh, have an inscribed circle. Sum of opposite signs, uh, sides are equal. So it's essentially string construction in action. So this. Uh, and that chapter, I still have some time. By the way, I didn't uh, ask how many minutes do I have. Well, I guess five minutes, something like that. So the whole talk is? It's an hour. Oh, an hour, OK. Um, all right, so ne next, next section, next chapter, Ponsel agreed. So uh, what you see here is, uh, what you can see really here, is a Ponsel and gone uh, somewhere in the middle. It has many, many sides. I don't know how many. Um, and what we do is we extend the sides. So if it's an N gone, we have N lines. And they form a lattice or a grid, if you wish. Uh, their intersection points are roughly N squ squared over two points. And that's what you see here. Uh, again, this is a projective theorem, but I present uh, in this picture confocal ellipses. <laughs> But what I'm going to, to say is projective invariance, so you can apply projective summation and get a different kind of picture. But I, I'm using, again, metric for, for, for proofs. Um, OK, so um, we have this set of points, finite set of points. But if n is large, it's a large set uh, called Ponsel grid. And um, I have uh, n lines which are sides of Ponsolet and Gon. Okay. Ah, or uh, probably better said, 
n periodic orbit of a billiard in, in ellipse. n lines, they intersect uh, roughly n squared over two points. OK? So um, now I, I want to tell you, uh, uh, to present a theorem about this set of points. It has a structure. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two ways to view this set of points. Uh, you can uh, see, actually, in this picture, there are concentric subsets. And then there are radial subsets. So for example, this point, this point, this point, they all belong to a radial subset. Now here is formal definition. I uh, enumerate lines consecutively, L1 through Ln. A concentric set number k, p sub k, uh, is uh, the set of intersection of lines whose indices uh, differ by, by k. And concentric set q sub k, the set of intersections of lines whose indices add up to k. Mod n, of course. Everything is cyclic mod n. OK? So here is a th theorem which consists of three statements. The first two statements are due to Darbu. The last statement, which is the strongest one, is due to Rich Schwartz, who also uh, rediscovered the first two statements as well. So the concentric set lies on nested ellipses. The radial set lies on disjoint um, hyperbolas. The complexified version of this conics share four tangent lines. So in my setup, if they are already confocal, this is a, an empty statement. They are confocal. From com complex point of view, confocal family share four tangent lines, which may, may be not visible, maybe imaginary, so to speak. And here is the last and most uh, strong statement. All concentric sets are projectively equivalent to each other. And all radial sets are projectively equivalent to each other. So this statement, uh, if you think of this as in terms of cross ratios, for example, this uh, invariant of projective, in projective geometry, tons and tons of cross ratios are equal. So it's a strong statement. And the proof, uh, Rich proved it using complex um, analysis. But I want to present at least the idea of the proof using billiards. That's my topic. OK, so again, the same coordinate system on the inner ellipse. Uh, and we can choose the origin for this, uh, for this um, coordinates in such a way that the tangency points of these uh, sides of the, the um, Poncelli polygon have coordinates 0, 1 nth, 2 nth, and up to n minus 1 over n. It's n gone. They're equi uh, equidistributed in this um, coordinate. And now uh, we use the string coordinates. Remember, every point outside the ellipse has two coordinates. You draw two tangent lines, just read the coordinates on the ellipse. Uh, so the points uh, of the concentric set P sub k, their coordinates, this string coordinates, so to speak, are 0 k over n, 1 n, k plus 1 over n, and so on. The difference is constant because um, uh, of the uh, geometry of the situation. And yeah, that's what I said. Uh, it follows that that set P sub k belongs to confocal ellipses because confocal ellipses are given by the condition that the difference is constant. And uh, the same argument acts for uh, radial set. Now, to finish, the proof, to, to prove the, the hard uh, part, one needs another lemma by Ivory, uh, which um, is really a one-line computation, which I don't present. I can't prove everything. Um, so here is a statement. Suppose we have two confocal ellipses, a gamma small and gamma capital, which are centered at the origin and symmetric with respect to x and y axis. Then there is a linear map, diagonal matrix uh, A, which takes uh, one to another. So the statement is that for every point of the inner ellipse, its image under this map, uh, so every point P, its image A of P, they lie on the same confocal hyperbola. It's a one-line computation, but let, let me leave it as an exercise. OK, so the claim is that that very linear map A in our situation of confocal uh, conics uh, takes the concentric set P sub K to concentric set P sub M. This is uh, true if uh, the difference between K and M is even. And if it's odd, you need to reflect in the origin. 
So it's either plus or minus A, which does the job. Maybe I will skip uh, the next slide. So if uh, you allow me, uh, I will leave the end of the proof uh, as an exercise. Uh, it's that thing here. The slides will be available. I just am afraid that I will not show you enough pictures if I uh, finish that. And um, instead, I want to show you a picture. So here is a picture uh, which combines Poncelet grid theorem and um, Schall theorem. Remember, every quadrilateral has an inscribed circle. So this is um, that picture for um, confocal ellipses. So the polygon here, I don't know how many sizes it has. Well, whatever it is, n. this n gone uh, is, uh, if you wish, a periodic billiard trajectory inside an ellipse. Ellipse is not shown here. And here is a more striking picture showing the same thing, which I stole from this uh, paper recently published by Akapian and Babenka, um, which all is devoted to this uh, phenomenon. So here you have many, many, many lines, and that n gone probably has very large n. The next section of my talk concerns configuration theorems, which come uh, again from uh, billiards and ellipses. Uh, so this is an um, illustration for uh, n equal to 7. This um, uh, purple uh, polygon is uh, heptagon, 7 gone. So what do you see here? The inner green heptagon is actually so I, not to, to make it too crowded, I didn't draw uh, the ellipses uh, through these points and tangent to these lines. But we start with Poncelet heptagon. And now we do the following. Uh, I create purple points by intersecting lines, skipping one. So this line, I skip this one, intersect with that one, and do it secretly. So I create this purple heptagon. Then I create green heptagon by intersecting lines, skipping two. So for example, I take this line, I skip this, I skip this, and intersect with that. This gives me this point. OK? So from the inner green heptagon, I construct intersecting lines, skip one, the purple one, skip two, the green one. Now I do the same with purple and green. With purple, I intersect sides, skipping two. So for example, this side, I skip two, intersect with this side, and get to this red point. With the green one, I intersect sides, skipping one. So for example, I take this side, skip this one, intersect with this, get the same point. So the theorem is in the picture. These two operations, from green to purple and to red, from green to green to red, yield the same red thing. So it's configuration theorem. In other words, uh, there is a configuration like that. You can erase uh, ellipses here. Uh, and uh, every point is, uh, has valence four. So there are four lines through every point, And there are four points on every line. I'm not an expert on uh, configurations, but it's, it's a field. There is a book by Grunbaum which is a thick book devoted to these kind of things. And there was, apparently, there was an open question whether uh, there exist configurations like this uh, which are flexible. So people knew that if one starts with a regular n-gon and do what I described, then one, one would get a configuration like this. And the proof was uh, using calculations, some trigono trigonometric identities. Of course, it's a projective statement. So you can start with regular polygon, apply projective transformation, and you get something which doesn't look like regular. But the question was, are there other deformations of this? And what I'm telling you, you can start with uh, every Poncelet polygon. So there are many more. There is more flexibility here than just projective group. Apparently, it's a new result, which is of interest in that subfield of um, combinatorial geometry. So I want to prove it for you, probably the last proof. Um, OK, so for the proof, I need uh, names. Uh, so the green thing uh, in the middle at the very center, I call it P, polygon P. And uh, then I have blue, green, and red outer. So purple is actually blue. 
it is blue on my screen. <laughs> yes. Um, green uh, is G, and the red outer one is R. OK? So try to keep this picture in mind, but now the proof, unfortunately, needs a different slide. But it's one, one slide. OK, so we have two uh, pairs of transformations here. One are projected transformations, F and G, uh, which come from Poncelet grid theorem. Remember that last statement that all concentric sets are projectively equivalent. And in my confocal situation, they are actually equivalent by um, linear transformations given by diagonal matrices. So I call this F and G. So F takes P, the inner green uh, heptagon, to blue one. G takes the inner green uh, heptagon to green one. These are two linear transformations which commute because they are given by diagonal matrices. Then we have two other operations, intersecting sides, skipping one or two sides. I call them uh, phi and psi. <coughs> and phi takes the inner green uh, heptagon to blue one, skipping one side. Psi takes the inner greener one, uh, green one to larger green one, skipping two sides. These are two operations which we use. OK. Now, what is the, the red outer polygon? How do we come to it? There are two ways, and we need to show that two ways coincide. So one way, uh, F composed with G applied to P. G of P is G capital. So F G to P is F to, to green. Now green is P C of P. So f of g is f of c of p. Now, critical thing. Phi, uh, psi and f commute. f is projected transformation, and psi is an operation on, on lines. You can do it first and then projectively transform, or you can first apply trajectory transformation and then intersect the lines. The result is the same. So I use that, and finally f of p is b, so the first line gives me p of b. OK? Exactly in the same way, the second line, I start with g composed with f of p, do the same thing, and arrive at phi of g. But the left-hand sides are equal. f and g commute, these are two diagonal matrices. So the right-hand sides are equal. But that's exactly what I stated. The red polygon is obtained twice. So here's another picture. Uh, here, n is equal to 8. And projected transformation is applied, so they, uh, you don't see confocal things anymore. Um, the proof for even, so I'm cheating here. The proof for even is not written down yet. The proof I presented only works for in odd case. Uh, it's true for even, but there's a paper to be, to be written, uh, uh, collaborating with people who are experts on configurations, and for them it's really an exciting result. Um, of course, you can change the number. So here is a 17 gone. I don't know the Greek name for that. And uh, you can skip a um, different number of sides. I presented one and two, but here uh, skips are different. You can combine uh, such theorems, such configuration theorems, uh, more than once. So this is, uh, I don't know how many gone, but uh, there are two layers of that theorem here combined. Uh, the decagon, yes, ah, it's written here. <laughs> um, yes. Um, and uh, a remark about this theorem, uh, there is a different way to, to, to see it uh, if you are working on discrete integrable systems, uh, namely pentagram map, uh, kind of a famous now um, completely integrable discrete um, uh, system, uh, which was also uh, discovered by Rich Schwartz about 30 years ago. And uh, the way it works, uh, again, it's projective geometry and very elementary one. You start with the polygon, you draw diagonals, you uh, diagonals, uh, for example, you skip one vertex, you intersect uh, the diagonals, you create a new polygon. That's the map. But we consider polygons only up to projective equivalence, and uh, it, the big result is that this system is completely integrable. So if we start with the Poncelet uh, polygon, so in this picture it's a red one, and uh, we use a different 
depth of diagonal. So uh, skip one vertex or skip two vertices. I call this transformations T2 and T3. And the result is that they commute. It's not true for any polygon, but for Poncelet polygons, polygons it's true. And I think it's a new result uh, in the study of pentagram maps. Um, everything I said can be generalized. You don't have to stay in the plane. You don't have to consider Euclidean metric. There is a um, larger class of metrics called Louisville metrics, which in local coordinates are written in this way. And for them, many results which I presented still hold. So here's an example. I, I don't want to, to go into differential geometry uh, deeply, but here's an example. So this is a, a Lipsoid in three-dimensional space, and uh, you see this um, two systems of curves. These are lines of cur curvature. They are orthogonal to each other, and they play the same role as confocal ellipses and hyperbolas. So in particular, if you play billiard uh, using geodesics, of course, uh, on the surface, uh, billiards inside uh, domains bounded by these curves. Uh, these billiard systems will be integrable. They will have... Um, curves from the same family and from the other family as caustics, and many other things hold. But I don't want to go in this direction. Instead, in the last four or three minutes, I want to show you a little bit more. OK, so let me introduce Dan Resnick. Dan, Dan Resnick is not a mathematician, really. He is an engineer. He worked uh, in California on solar energy. Uh, their startup was sold to, I think, General Electric. Uh, he became independently wealthy, went back to his native country, Brazil, and uh, he has some time on his hands. And um, he spent several years doing computer experiments on billiards and ellipses and related things around Poncelet theorem. And um, here is uh, his paper, which has 80 new invariants um, of uh, periodic uh, trajectories and elliptic billiards. He discovered experimentally many, many unknown things about this system. Uh, some of them are proved. Uh, most of them are conjectured only. But they certainly hold because computers are so. Um, so I refer to this two papers in which I participated with proof of some of his results. And uh, the last thing I want to do is to show you two of these results. So one result is this. Uh, this is an ellipse. This is a periodic trajectory. Uh, consider the angles. So Poncelet theorem, or integrability, says that uh, this periodic trajectory actually belongs to a family. You can turn this periodic trajectory around. And uh, the question is, what do these uh, polygons in this one parameter family share? So they share a lot. I already showed you Joachim style integral. But here's one new quantity. So the sum of uh, cosines of the angles is constant in this one parameter family. And actually, we know what it is. It's Joachim style integral times the perimeter of this polygon minus n. n is 5 in this picture. So that's one theorem. I'm not going to prove it. Don't, don't worry. And uh, here's another. <coughs> so again, periodic orbit inside this ellipse. Now we take the impact points and draw tangent uh, lines. So what we get is another n gone, which is uh, circumscribed about this ellipse. So the th uh, theorem is uh, that in this one parameter family, as you move it around, the product of cosines of the angles of this outer polygon is constant. Maybe it's not so much surprising. I mean, um, it's two-dimensional integrable system. So all integrals are functionally dependent of each other. I already showed you Joachim Stahl, and uh, this is, must be a function of th that integral. The previous one is also a function. Actually, I told you which function. But um, to, to find this particular formula is, is interesting, and proving this is not trivial at all. So that's the last thing I want to say, and thank you very much. Uh, which, which one? The last two? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, there are two, two different approaches. One uh, using, yes, uh, simply, well, area form. And another is um, the one with Bailey. So uh, Bailey has, a, has discovered a non-traditional, non-standard non uh, generating function for billiards. 
uh, and um, so usually the genetic function is just distance, the, the length of, of, of a chord. But uh, genetic function principle is not unique. So Bell discovered another one, uh, which is suggested by convex geometry, by support function, and used it uh, in a serious way, but also in this less serious. Uh, so there are different ways to, to, to do it, but none of them, as far as I know, are trivial. Not just like that. Take some work. In, the, in this last uh, theorem about going between impact points and tangent lines, uh, is it related to a picture? There's a also due to Poncelet was the fact that you have a, in the dual projective plane that, that you can think of, uh, switch in, uh, tangent lines with impact points for on the on the dual conic. Uh, are you asking whether there is a billiard system? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, there is. Uh, um, okay, I, <coughs> yes. Um, so let me try to answer. I think it will be more or less answering your question. Uh, so suppose you, you play this game in the spherical geometry, not in the plane. So in spherical geometry, you have a duality between points and oriented great circles. This duality interchanges distances and uh, angles. But angles is essentially areas because of gauss banner OK, so if you apply this duality to the usual billiard in spherical geometry, what you get is uh, outer billiard, which I can draw in the plane. So you have a convex billiard table, but you play outside. Instead of lines, you take points. What you do is you draw tangent line, and then you reflect. So point x goes to point y. This is called outer billiard. You, you can define it in the Euclidean in a fine plane as well. But in the spherical geometry, this is just dual and conjugated to usual billiard. So yes, projective duality does the, the job. Yes. Yeah, for the extended pentagram mappa, is there a chance that uh, the, the new polygons that you're playing are Inscribed in your conic? Inscribed in what? Your conic. Uh, if you start with the poncele, yes. 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 Uh, it's, it's, it's known. Not necessarily confocal. Not necessarily what? Confocal. Uh, no, it's a projective statement. Uh, yeah, yeah. If it was confocal, I can always apply projective transformation. Yeah. It's true, yes. Poncele goes to poncele. But I don't think it was known that this deep diagonal maps commute. For on on, on Ponsole, polygons. Could you give a projective statement of the first Ponsole theorem that was in this last thing, where you have the n equally spaced points somehow, and then you, there was a theorem first? I wanted to hear a projective statement because, first of all, the first part of that question would be, what are these n points projectively? Uh, so, I guess you are. Talking about Poncelle grid. This one? Yeah, the first point out. Well, maybe the first theorem in this section. Yeah, I want to hear a projective statement. Well, here the projective statement is that uh, all con uh, co um, concentric sets. So yeah, this that's is. That's not projective. No, no, I didn't finish. <laughs> you have two sets here. Uh, this set of points and this set of points. I don't have that. I don't have those curves even. No, no there are no curves. For, forget curves. You, you start with the Poncelet polygon. It has n sides. Hmm? What does that mean? It means a polygon which is inscribed into a conic and circumscribed about a conic. It's projective notion. It's what? It's projective notion. You have two conics. Yeah. You have an n gone. You have two conics. Yes. You have an n-gon whose vertices lie on one conic and whose sides are tangent to another conic. Okay. This is called projective n-gon. Now take uh, n sides of it as n lines, enumerate them cyclically, intersect. You get a large set of points. So one of the statements is that if you consider the set of points defined like this, in this picture, these are these points. Ignore the curve, just consider the set of points and this set of points. So the claim is that there is a projective transformation which takes that set to that set. There could be n, it's about n points here and about n points here. And these two large sets of points are projectively equivalent. It's totally projective statement. 
but uh, the proof I try to present, at least half of this proof, uh, uses Euclidean geometry, confocal families. The original proof by Schwartz uh, is complex projective. He, 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 he did it totally different, differently. Yeah, I don't know why. Uh, just a second. Uh, <laughs> it probably didn't connect. Is it off? Uh, it's off probably. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Mm. Well, I don't, don't want to define this in general, especially because different people define slightly differently. But in our situation, there are two things which are preserved. There is invariant quantity integral, uh, which I presented this Joachim style integral, and there is an invariant area form. Okay. It's dimension two. You don't need anything yeah. else. Well, there's only one integral, so it commutes with itself. But uh, of course, if you consider, for example, uh, billiards inside ellipsoids in high dimensional space, there will be uh, roughly n integrals, and they will be commuting, and there will be a Poisson structure. But in the plane, you don't need all this, just area and um, one, one function. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you.